warm welcome to the Precision Therapy for Lung Cancer channel. I am Dr. Muhammad Jahanzeb, entrusted with the role of channel coordinator. Beyond this, I am a professor of clinical medicine, hematology, and oncology at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida, and a former board of director and panel member of the NCCN Guidelines for Lung Cancer and Breast Cancer. Before we start, you may want to switch on the subtitles of your preferred language. On the video screen, you may switch on subtitles by clicking CC icon. To choose your subtitle language, please click setting icon. Go to captions. Then, select auto translate to open a language bar. Scroll down the bar and pick your preferred subtitles language. The subtitles now appear underneath the video screen. Now, please enjoy the video. Hello, welcome everyone to the Prasiska Lung Cancer Tumor Board, 63-year-old woman, predictably a never smoker, who presented with increasing back pain and a performance status of two because of the back pain, had a history of hypertension, pneumonia, uh, and um, as, as I said, no history of tobacco smoking. And um, in January of 2021, had a, a mass in the lumbar spine with metastasis and got uh, metastasis. Uh, also had, unfortunately, multiple brain metastasis, had surgical resection of the lumbar lesion, and biopsy was consistent with adenocarcinoma, and the, and the mutation testing revealed exon 19 EGFR mutation, and she underwent radiation therapy to the brain as well as spine, and we have the CT scan from, um, uh, from the diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Ginsberg? So in, in this uh, image, we see that uh, we have bilateral, patchy, uh, crown glass opacities, more in a peripheral distribution, a few small areas of consolidation. All these are very nonspecific findings, but in the appropriate clinical setting could represent a pneumonitis, which could be treatment related. So this is, I, I think you are right on. And uh, this patient initiated osimertinib and within a month uh, became uh, quite symptomatic with hypoxia. And would you, not, would you say that these findings are quite consistent with drug-induced pneumonitis in this setting? In the appropriate clinical setting, yes. That's what we would suggest. And, uh, you know, one thing to have asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic pneumonitis, another thing is to be, you know, to have significant pneumonitis requiring uh, support uh, in the hospital. Um, the challenge here is, here is a tumor that is amenable to traumatic responses with uh, osimertinib and EGFRTK inhibitor, but unfortunately, the pneumonitis is pretty severe. Again, a Common problem, Dr. Stinchcomb, how would you manage this patient? Well, thank you, Dr. Govindan. I think that this is one of the more challenging uh, scenarios because you have uh, a tumor that's very uh, sensitive to these medications, but this patient has experienced a uh, relatively severe toxicity. Um, I think there are case reports of re-challenge of osimertinib, but I, I really can't say that that's a standard of care option at this point, because I think um, there are only case reports, and also in this case, specifically the uh, severity of the toxicity. Therefore, the standard therapies would be either uh, a platinum doublet, such as carboplatinum pemetrexid, and then I think the four drug uh, combination of carboplatinum, pagotaxel, atezolizumab, and bevacizumab um, has shown activity in patients with EGFR mutation who've had a progression on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, albeit a, a subset analysis of a larger trial. Um, and so I think those would be the, sort of the three options that um, I would discuss with this patient. You know, it's, there's a, this is a common problem. And uh, I mean, this is a common scenario where we, a lung cancer experts get called for assistance. Um, the one question I get frequently from our community oncology colleagues is that, uh, how about trying a lot of it? Would you do that? Uh, personally, I would not. I think that there's a rate of pneumonitis uh, with all these drugs. And I think my concern is the rate of pneumonitis may be the same with a lot of it, but the efficacy may be less. And so therefore, 
Um, I'm a little bit concerned that changing the class of the uh, um, drug from a third generation to the first generation is going to reduce the risk of a recurrent pneumonitis. Yeah, I, I agree with you. In fact, this is a class effect, not a drug specific effect. And in general, my rule of thumb is that if somebody had you know, occasional cough and uh, very faint infiltrates, we would consider treating them. But then if somebody required oxygen, had to be in the hospital, that too within a month of starting this, switching to another EGFR-TK inhibitor would not be a good idea. And I think osimetinib or any other EGFR-TKI would uh, very likely result in significant immunitis. And in the early days, I had lost, uh, lost a few patients in the past uh, from EGFR-TKI-induced pneumonitis. So this is not a trivial issue. The other challenging question is that uh, with somebody who has experienced pneumonitis, is it uh, reasonable to give them a checkpoint inhibitor like pembrolizumab or tesalizumab, the way you mentioned? Uh, would you just give this patient just a double therapy or would you venture to add an immune checkpoint inhibitor alone or with, uh, as you said, pembrolizumab? Um, uh, complicated question. I, I think there's some concern that the sequencing of immunotherapy and TKIs, there might be a, a higher rate of pneumonitis for uh, osimertinib after immunotherapy, and there's some interaction. I personally found the four-drug uh, Empower regimen to be relatively uh, difficult to give, largely due to the, the taxane toxicities. And in, in this patient who's um, a PS2, um, if I recall correctly, um, I would probably lean a little bit more towards the carboplatin and pemetrexid really for multiple reasons um, at this point. I agree with you. I would treat this patient with pemetrexid and carboplatin because as you and I know, pemetrexid is quite active in this uh, population. Patients tolerate this uh, drug very well with no neuropathy. And although you have to watch for fatigue, some nausea, fluid retention, and uh, some renal dysfunction, especially if they take other agents like non -steroidals. and uh, But by and large, it's well tolerated. I try to stay away from immune checkpoint inhibitor for these patients right after the EGFR-TK inhibitors. And I also do the reverse too. I'm very cautious in starting somebody with uh, locally advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer with EGFR mutation who had received duralumab when they progress. I don't start them right away on osimertinib. I do give them some time to cool off for the effects of them to go away at least three months. Um, and there is some concern that concurrent uh, checkpoint inhibitor and EGFR TKI, certainly not a good idea. Leads to higher incidence of pneumonitis, upwards of close to even 25%. But even sequential one, I've seen anecdotally people running into problems. So I would stay away from a checkpoint inhibitor in this situation. And I almost never use the four drug combination. I don't see a big advantage uh, with that. And you led Dr. Stinchcomb studies that, uh, that really looked at the benefit of adding bevacizumab. So since you said you won't give checkpoint inhibitor, you would give metrexate carboplatin, would you add bevacizumab in this setting? And you led one of those seminal trials here. So do you want to comment on that? Sure. I think, uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Gubendin. I think um, there are trials of EGFR, TKI plus bevacizumab. And I think uh, in most trials, the response rate was the same and there might be a, a difference in progression for survival, but not overall survival. Um, and I think, think we're, uh, the EGFR mutation subtype may get a, a little bit more benefit from bevacizumab than the general population, but I'm not convinced that it's such a great benefit to uh, add the additional toxicities that we see with uh, uh, high blood pressure, coughing up blood, hemoptysis, and the hypertension at this point. And I most often have done carboplatin and pemetrexid without bevacizumab in this situation. Yeah, and in terms of the future directions, so there are other, um, you know, by the dual antibodies, the EGFR met antibody that just got approved for the Exxon 20 EGFR insertions, uh, EGFR Exxon 20 insertion, I should say. And, um, but I, I still think the class effect would be an issue, don't you think? I think so. And I think um, it's a very difficult when uh, the patients get this uh, toxicity because it does sort of really limit. Um, your options down the road. So when I have patients, I make sure that we really have done due diligence to exclude everything else. And I, I, I worry sometimes now with immune therapy and TKIs, people are so reflexively putting on prednisone and calling it pneumonitis and not uh, realizing the long-term implications. I want to bring one practical point here, and I want to bring Dr. Ginsburg into the discussion now. You know, when I see patients who have had drug-induced pneumonitis, osimertinib-induced pneumonitis, I have a patient exactly like this, a physician's mother, 
um, who had significant immunitis, exactly this description. And uh, we weaned her off. Uh, we obviously took her off prednisone or took her off osimertinib, put her on prednisone, and weaned her off prednisone. And now uh, what we see is now and then we see this uh, interstitial infiltrates get a little dense. And then the radiologists read this as consistent with disease progression. Although symptomatically, this patient is remarkably better. Uh, while a good portion of the lung is cleared, over time, you do see some changes. And there's always this concern, is there an underlying lymphangetic disease progression or uh, disease or, or this uh, inflammation acting up? Uh, any, any, any comment on that? I mean, more commonly in my experience, uh, these things either go down and resolve or leave some residual interstitial thickening, more like a fibrosis. Uh, it's rare that you would have lymphangitic spread and it wouldn't be in both lungs anyway. Um, so if you see it bilaterally, I would favor some residual of the pneumonitis. And it's interesting when you said that erlotinib in the early days, uh, we saw a fair amount of uh, pneumonitis uh, and more severe in some sense than what we're seeing now with osinemertinib and other uh, drugs. It's also that we've learned how to watch for them and prevent them from getting worse. And I'm sure that it's a learning curve there too. So right. I, I think this is, uh, this is a great discussion. So I want to summarize that. How do you manage uh, somebody with EGFR pneumonitis? And um, uh, I would say uh, that um, the, the main issues with the EGFR pneumonitis is obviously to stop osimertinib and then uh, treat these patients with um, uh, appropriately prednisone. And once the symptoms have gotten better, uh, these patients are treated mainly with uh, uh, chemotherapy. And the recommendation of the tumor board is uh, uh, to hold off on uh, using immune checkpoint inhibitor or VEGF inhibitors uh, and use, patient, use predominantly a platinum-based chemotherapy for these patients. The tumor board also would recommend that patients who have had the uh, osimertinib pneumonitis uh, not be treated with other EGFRTK inhibitors as uh, there is a concern that and this is a class effect and that would be applicable for the newer emerging EGFR antibodies as well. Thank you very much. Dear peers, if you have any interesting or even controversial comments, please feel free to post them or email them to me at kol at p2pmd.net. I will reply to these comments in a special Q&A video next month. Please take 10 seconds to learn how you can be more than just a spectator at P2P. Right now, tens of thousands of healthcare professionals are actually watching this video. You may take this opportunity to post your own cases, best practices, and research data in the comment box underneath the video. So, don't miss out on this chance to make your work known to global peers. If you have any captivating insights that you would like to share with your peers, please email your thoughts to kol at p2pmd.net. Here at P2P, we welcome collaboration with the brightest minds on the planet.